given by uh, Joe Martinez from Google and UCSB. Uh, uh, there's no introduction because everybody here knows it. Okay. <laughs> Yeah, th thank you for the, the great invitation to talk to you today. Uh, i sorry I had to delay the start of my talk. There was a big review at Google yesterday on our quantum project where we were kind of doing for a bigger ask, and I really had to go to that. And what's cool about a Google review uh, at Google is that I could wear my quantum hardware t-shirt during this big formal presentation and everything everyone's okay with that um, so yeah the talk here is going to be about building uh, and hopefully we want to build a useful quantum computer and I just want to go through the science and technology of doing that and uh, you know f tell you where where we're going here and this talk, I think, is going to be a little bit different than what you hear a lot of times at physics summer schools because it's b all about building complex systems, okay? Not, you know, we've been in this era for many years. I started this, I don't know, in the mid-80s where we've been working about, worried about devices and components, kind of how to put them together a little bit. Okay, which is great. We need to do that. We need to understand that. I'll mostly be reviewing that. But it's an eye towards building something very complex so that we can, we can build a powerful quantum computer. And because of the complexity, I'm going to have to talk about this in a little bit different way than maybe you've been hearing. I think there's been a prior talks on superlighting qubits, which is great. But I'm going to talk about it in a different way. And the, only, the analogy I would give is if you're draw, trying to build, you know, this thing, you don't design this using Maxwell's equations. I mean, you know they're there and they're the fundamental whatever, but you use a ton of other concepts to understand how to build complexity. Okay? And so we're going to talk about fundamental concepts. We're going to build concepts on that so that you can deal with the complexity and eventually build something, you know, crazy, crazy difficult. And that's what we're doing. And it's actually kind of interesting because, you know, if you think about the history of electrical engineering, it started, say, with Maxwell equations. But over 100 years, they had to invent circuit theory and microwave engineering and microelectronics, all these other things that describe what was going on. And it's a really fun time to try to take the concepts of physics and, uh, you know, pull out the right parts so you can deal with complexity. Now, we need to do complexity. We need to scale up these systems to make it powerful. Okay, that's why we're trying to do that. And just to give you an idea, as a Google employee, what I have to worry about in terms of powerful, I want to show this uh, uh, computer that was just recently announced by Google uh, Google I.O., I think about three months ago. Um, it's called a tensor processing unit, and it's used to solve special purpose computer, solve uh, machine learning applications. So, you know, uh, AI is a big thing. We're the quantum AI lab. When you use your Google phone and it answers your queries and do things, these things eventually get trained on very big, powerful computers. The problem is, is when they make data farms out of regular CPUs, just, you know, millions of copies essentially of this, very expensive, not as powerful. They're making special purpose processors now. So this particular TPU made here, this has 100 petaflops of computing power. I don't know if anyone really knows what that means. Basically, 100 petaflops is about the level of the biggest supercomputer on Earth right now. So China had the, the biggest one, and then uh, DOE, I think it's the summit uh, one, came up with something bigger. And this is at the size of a supercomputer in these few little racks, and we said Google has several of them. And they're designed with special purpose uh, architecture you know, to make it powerful for solving certain uh, things. And Google is interested in saying, okay, if we're going to spend all this money and time building a special purpose processor to solve some of our important problems, well, we should maybe do the same with a quantum computer. Quantum computer won't help us with every problem, 
but maybe there's some problems that will help, especially machine learning, where we can use a quantum computer to make things go there. So there's a lot of investment right now in special purpose hardware to get these things to work right, uh, work, pro uh, work powerfully. So, uh, so yeah, okay, uh, you know, this is, this is kind of, uh, this is what we have to compete against, okay? And we're hoping this year to do our quantum supremacy experiment, whereas when we run our quantum experiment and we need to check it, we have to check it with some of the biggest supercomputers on the planet to see if it's going to work. So this is not some far off dream. Of course, doing something useful is still farther off, but we're really thinking about this kind of level. So I want to kind of give the story uh, behind uh, you know, doing all that. Oh, yes? How much does the development of these supercomputers cost? How much more? You know, I actually, I don't know that, and I'm probably not to know. I'm going to guess there were probably about 100 engineers on this, maybe a few hundred engineers with software. So, uh, you know, that's uh, maybe uh, $100 million to develop that, but then they're making multiple copies, and then they're building the next generation. So, you know, numbers like that. Uh, I'm just guessing, though. Yeah, thank you. So, you know, they spent a lot of money on this. Okay, so it's a really exciting time in this field to think about building these complex systems. Because the physics has been worked out well enough that, you know, it's time to move forward. I hear often it said, oh, we understand all the physics and now it's just engineering. <laughs> Do not believe that. That is the most ridiculous. It must be made by some theorist um, <laughs> uh, somewhere. It's, it's got to be. But it's really ridiculous because there's a lot of things to figure out. And that's actually what I want to talk about here. There's something very fundamentally hard about it. But it's really cool. There's a lot of different approaches, a lot of different management structures, funding structures, technological things. It's really going to be interesting to see what works and what doesn't. Okay. What's interesting about superconductors is we've got it to work on, on modest scale systems. We kind of know how to scale it up. And we have to fix a lot of problems and do that. It's a very interesting time where we can do that. But there's this kind of quantum space race with different companies and uh, different uh, countries. Uh, there's a big U.S. thing winding its, winding its way through the EU, China. We're all, everyone's working on it. So very exciting time. Um, you know, one thing, this is the biggest thing I want to get across just for, you know, as I go give talks around the country, around the world, is everyone talks about the number of qubits you have, okay? And, you know, 50 seems to be a magic number. We're partly to blame for that. Uh, there's a reason for that. I'll talk about it later. Um, but, you know, people talk about that. How many qubits you have you have? And, you know, number, scaling up qubits is important, just like having a bigger computer is important. The point I want to make is that is really not the big issue. That's really not the big problem, okay? And the problem is not quantity. The problem is quality. Okay, and what happens is, is we get devices like this, and the quality of the transistors in here are perfect. They don't, they essentially don't go wrong, and you can make more and more, and everything works right, and the things are, they, they know how to deal with all that. The quality of qubits are fundamentally error prone. And, you know, we know that, okay? This is, this is a fundamental thing. And because of that, quality, is absolutely baked in to what you have to do when you think about, uh, you know, think about building this up and getting it to work. And, you know, I feel a little bit embarrassed in here. I'm going to talk a little bit about quality in my talks and, and emphasize that. It's probably un underemphasized, but it's something that we really have to talk about. Just to give you a concept of what's going on is Right now, if you look at the commercial quantum computers that are out there, IBM, Rigetti, as China has something here, what is the average error rate of the, hard inter the hardest thing to do is this to couple two qubits together? What is it? It's about 5%. Okay? So 5% of the time, it has some kind of error. What does that mean? That means you do 20 or 40 operations, and you're going to 
essentially destroy the, the coherence of your qubit. Okay? So doing a quantum computer with 20 and 40 operations is interesting. It's good physics. We have to, you know, getting the thing to work is hard. I mean, we don't understand all that. But that's not a lot of operations. Okay? And you can't do anything powerful. So just to give an illustration of that, you know, what does 20 or 40 operations mean, say, classically? Well, I dug out some, some chips from my, car, my, my hobby box I have from high school, and these are 7400 TTL transistor uh, uh, chips that have about uh, four NAND gates per that, and I have five of them. Classically, that's 20 gates, okay? And uh, for old people, this means something you guys probably don't do. But you might use this breadboard for a simple academic exercise. In the 19, late 60s or 70, you might have built a little circuit from this to do some simple controller or something. But this is not very powerful. 20 gates, 40 gates is not very powerful. But you can do stuff. You can set, certainly test things and write papers. It's cool. But that's fine. What we're trying to do is scale this up so that it's hundreds, maybe a thousand gates, okay, which is well beyond this. And then you're starting to do something powerful and interesting, and actually we'll talk about quantum supremacy. There's actually a useful application for that. It's a minor one, but it's useful. So let's try to do something. And to do that, you have to, talk, you have to understand that you have to make good qubits. And to make you qubits as you scale them up is really hard. So let's you know, talk about how we're going to think about doing that. So that, that's really important. So note, like quality is not necessarily something that you think about as a physicist, except maybe you're, you're at NIST, okay, and you do metrology. And I used to work there, so that's baked into my brain. It's, that's important. But uh, it, it's really important as we move forward to do that and, and understand how to, how to do, that, uh, do that properly. It's, it, it's, the problem is in science, it's much easier to do something new than it is to do something better. If you want to get your nature or science or PRL, which is good for your career, I understand that. If you want to do something better, it's hard to convince you know, other referees that that's great. And when I, I'm, when I tell everyone this, I'm trying to say, look, in our whole academic system, we should be promoting people doing it better. I mean, that's really important. And if we don't make these qubits better than 5% errors, what's going to happen to the field? It's gone. Okay? You, I know everyone's here hoping to stay in this field, and we're trying to generate jobs for you at Google and elsewhere. <laughs> right? Right? Okay, you know. You want to have a Google job because then you get treated as a software engineer, which is really good. Okay, that's really good. So try to cr create jobs for you, okay? So anyway, yeah, someone once said, uh, we want to make qubits great again. Okay, so that's... <laughs> okay, now, uh, I want to talk now about the language we're going to use and the style. This is kind of fun. And I talk about Hamiltonians. So one of the, so I'll start with a really interesting story that just blows me away when I think about it. I'm often asked, and other people in the group are asked, to give talks to like uh, uh, Silicon Valley forums where there's executives and other engineers, and they want to find out about uh, quantum information. It's a really hot topic, so it's cool. And I, I, I give a certain talk in a certain way, but I often hear other groups talking about quantum information, and they go on and on about the Hamiltonian of the system. And, you know, we all know that's important. We've been listening to that, like in the previous lecture. That's great. But the response from the audience is really interesting when you start talking about Hamiltonians. And what they say is, why is this guy talking about this Broadway musical? <laughs> I don't get it. And after you've heard that a few times, 
you realize that you know our language and the language is it's just really separate okay so um, what I'm, I'm trying to emphasize is you know Hamiltonians are great right we, we need that to describe our system and I'm going to use that but we're going to use more broader concepts and you know when you have this microprocessor here you do not start the design by writing a Hamiltonian of the system right you know that's way down in let's say how the, the transistors work and you're going to use circuit theory and uh, uh, lots of other things to do for complex systems so we're going to have to I'm going to have to teach you that uh, fortunately this is all basic physics that you probably forgot about as in you know a long time ago or some time ago but uh, that and what is interesting here is that we can talk about I'd say 50 percent of how this circuit works maybe a little bit more using just circuit theories inductors capacitors resistors okay and I know most of the people have forgotten that so I have to do that uh, 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 review that a little bit and then maybe 30 percent of that is microwave electronics and about 20 percent is quantum physics okay so we, we're gonna have to go through that and this is really good because it means that when we hire electrical engineers on our project they can kind of understand most of that and they take a little quantum physics and it's not too complicated so so we can we can do that but it's a really different way to think about the problem so uh, you know but that's what you do for complex systems is uh, is, uh, is is to do that okay so qu that's kind of the, the introduction of you know the style of what I'm going to be doing here I'm actually not going to be writing down very many formulas because if you build this upright and you understand a little bit about electrical engineering you can kind of intuitively see what's going on and most of the formulas will be here and I'll, I'll talk about a little bit okay so, so that, that's, that's what we're trying to do. It's really a different way to think about quantum mechanics, kind of as uh, nonlinear resonators. That's really kind of a cool way to think about it. Just gives you a different set of intuition. And you know, clearly, we always have to go back to Hamiltonians if, if we want to know, know for sure what's going on. OK, so qubits, uh, we all understand from our undergraduate physics, you know, we can make uh, atomic uh, uh, quantum systems out of say the atoms or molecules a hydrogen atom and you know here I talk uh, here's the 1s and and 2s uh, states uh, which you can uh, kind of give you uh, these these cartoons of what the electron density looks like you can encode that in the zero one states and, and build it up that way we're building it up out of an electrical circuit Okay, so this is mostly aluminum. These are cuts in it. I'll explain this later. Um, what we have here is um, kind of in equivalent to this. We have current that's flowing both up and down this Josephson junction at the same time in some kind of quantum wave function. Okay, I want to point out that the at the beginning, this is very strange he here. Here, this is quantum mechanics of electrons, and we know electrons obey quantum mechanics here I'm talking about what's the quantum mechanics of currents and voltages currents flowing in the circuit voltages between the ground here and the center thing and these are these are uh, a collective behavior you know there's lots of electrons lots of Cooper pairs flowing into it you know b many billions trillions of, uh, of electrons here how, wh why should quantum mechanics be obeyed in these kind of collective systems? Okay, and that actually was the question we were asking when I was a student, and all this kind of began in the 80s for me. Uh, we just wanted to show that you could see quantum mechanics in this collective system, and uh, indeed it, it works and everything's great. And it's remarkable because you use the same machinery you use for this of you constructing the energies, the Lagrangians, the Hamiltonians, canonical variables, quantizing it, doing all that. And you just use these collective degrees of freedom. And you just write down those formulas and you solve it and everything works. And given all the experiments, or now it's getting pretty precise control experiments, it works. So it's remarkable. Quantum mechanics is a general phenomenon not just due to that describes electrons or photons, electromagnetic waves, or whatever. It describes collective.
behavior. So if I have a piece of chalk here, and you know if the conditions were cold enough, whatever, the, quanti the, the center of mass of this, of this, uh, this chalk and it's all, it's, it's few variables, would you could describe by quantum mechanics, and then you could predict its quantum behavior. Of course, it'd be hard to see that, but it works for collective degrees of freedom. That was not known in my, when we were in grad school if it worked. We thought it would work, but uh, that has absolutely been proven now, and because of that, uh, you know, we use that. Okay? Now, because of that, we can make big atoms. Okay, so we're used to having hydrogen's system, and the wave functions are about a nanometer size. Um, these particular things can be stretched out to maybe a micron apart in an, in an uh, ion trap, where these are still small, but they can be made to interact over micron distances. Uh, here's a Rydberg state. Again, the Rydberg state is maybe a micron size. You can do that on that scale. And then what I'm saying here is that for these superconducting circuits, you know, they might be uh, 10, 100 microns, maybe even a few centimeters in length, and you treat it as a collected degree of freedom, and it's at this gigantic length scale. And it's kind of cool that you can build uh, systems, uh, you know, these different length scales. Now, why do length scales matter? Okay, this is actually an important point. When you build something on these kind of lake scales, and people are trying to do it and have done it, you could have a qubit here, and for a single qubit, you can control it and see what's going on, that's fine. But if you want to build a complex system, you have to build lots of qubits, which would be all the different atoms here. But how do you control this Q, Q atom doing something and not having something do it next door? when any of your control signals, which are photons or some kind of magnetic field with a little coil, can't be smaller than the atoms you're kind of controlling. I mean, it's hard. So, um, you know, you, you kind of look at this and you say, well, if we had some large quantum systems, that would be easier. In fact, that's what's happening here. You get these things to interact over micron scales and you can come in with a, a laser and focus on this and control this atom. This You're making big molecules. And I'm going to say, and that's one of the reasons why, you know, Dave Wineland and others won Nobel Prize. They, they did some beautiful things. You have these beautiful atomic traps and, and the like. All this physics was, you know, because we took the quantum scale and made it bigger. So technologically, we could go in and manipulate it and do things. And then, okay, we're just playing that game some more here. Now it's bigger systems. Of course, it's a, it, interesting. And then this large atom has room for more complex control. If we have to build a little small microprocessor, microcontroller thing uh, within 100 microns of the device or so, maybe we can do that here. I'm not saying that it's advantageous. We don't know that yet. But it, it does give us uh, you know, more room to do things. And you know, clearly, you don't want to be in this range. And you want to be somewhere in that range. So that's a real advantage. Again, okay, I would say that's one of the reasons our, our system works, is it's large enough that we can design all these different kind of circuits here and get it to work and wire it up and, and uh, control it well. And, uh, you know, here people are still working on, you know, getting all this right. There's a lot of progress going very well. It's hard. Okay. <laughs> so the outline is to first work, uh, talk about kind of the device physics and, and the components, how it works, uh, from qubits uh, and circuit theory. We talk a lot about the quantum harmonic oscillator and transmons and how to couple them, <coughs> do measurement, and then we'll get on to error correction theory, uh, surface code. I think you've already done some error correction, but I want to really focus in on the surface code and uh, uh, a little bit decoherence and error correction experiment. And then the later lectures, we'll talk about some of the more ex uh, modern experiments and then leading up to the quantum supremacy experiment. Well, we'll see. I, I want to spend more time up here than down here, so we'll just see how it goes. Okay. So let me get started. And we're basically building, you know, we're building quantum oscillators. We're building oscillators. So I just want to start with the classical harmonic oscillator but talk about it in a way 
that's forward compatible to kind of understanding how qubits work. So, you know, this is all stuff you know, but it's just, it's maybe talked about in a little bit different way. So harmonic oscillator, typically mass on a spring, we can make inductor capacitor resonators where you have a charge and flux in the capacitor and inductor. You can have E and B fields and talking about photons, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And what happens, of course, is if you want to understand the dynamics, you can talk about the position or momentum, the canonical conjugate co uh, components, and then put yourself classically at some point uh, on position momentum space, and then let the system go, and then this will oscillate, uh, exchanging, if you like, the energy between position and momentum uh, uh, as, it, as, it, uh, as it moves. So you all know this, and uh, here's the little demo. Okay, it's moving around there. And it's going to oscillate at the natural oscillation frequency. So what I want you to do is go to the rotating frame. So as an experimentalist, what I think about is I put a camera right here, and I rotate the camera at omega zero, and then take a picture of this. And if I'm rotating the camera at the same uh, uh, you know, frequency as this is rotating, it's going to be stationary, uh, stationary in time. So in that case, uh, uh, your, your motion is, is static in time, okay? So that, that makes it simpler for you. So, and then what happens is whatever point you put yourself here, it's just this stationary in time, okay? And then, you, and then, of course, what's nice is if you want to know what happens as you're forcing the system, you force it on resonance, then uh, uh, it, uh, you have to drive it, of course, at the resonant frequency. Then you might start out in, at, at zero energy, and then as you drive it, it's going to go linearly time with an amplitude alpha. And the phase of the microwaves is going to determine what the phase is between here and here. Okay. Everyone okay with that? Okay. So that's the, that's the, that's the idea. Now, what happens with quantum mechanics? Okay, now I'm not going to drive anything. I'm just going to state the answer. I think we've all looked at this. In quantum mechanics, you have the ground state, kind of given by, a, uh, uh, by you know, some kind of Gaussian uh, picture here. You have to go to uh, uh, other, other kind of descriptions to more properly do that, but qualitatively. And this has an, because of a minimum of certainty between the two uh, 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 um, conjugate momentum, the area is, is given by uh, Planck's constant. Okay, so that's the ground state. Now, what happens when you drive it? It does the same thing when you drive it, the same thing as what happened classically, okay? And you're just displacing that quantum ground state by alpha. Very simple. So if you want to know the dynamics of a quantum system in the uh, uh, harmonic oscillator, it's very simple. You just calculate what happened classically and just say, well, okay, you're displacing, you know, that. And then, of course, is a coherent state. Coherent state is nothing but a displaced ground state that's just obeying the, the classical equations of motion. Okay? Now, what is perhaps less obvious is what happens if I have dissipation in the system. Okay, classically, you're out here and you have dissipation then the oscillations will damp over time, and then it will come into here. So what happens quantum mechanically? Same thing. That's, it's kind of cool. Exact same thing. And it just relaxes to the coherent state. Okay. And the reason it does that is the, um, uh, the coherent state, this displaced state, is an eigenstate of the destruction operator, okay? If you work that out, that's actually in Griffiths. If you work that out, and because of that, kind of dissipation is coming from the destruction operator and then being an eigenstate, this just goes like that. Okay, very simple description. Okay. Response, quantum equals classical. Okay, that's, that's stuff we should know. It's kind of an interesting way to say it. Now, here's a question. 
if, if the classical response and the quantum response for harmonic, harmonic oscillator is the same, how did we ever discover photons? Right? Okay, so how, how did we get quantum mechanics out of this? Okay. And it's because we have nonlinear detectors when we absorb a photon and measure its energy, that's a nonlinear operation here. That's not here. Okay? And when you, uh, you do something in a nonlinear way with a harmonic oscillator, then things get interesting quantum mechanically. Okay? And I'll give you an example. But this is what happened with the block, the, the, the Planck black body, Planck law black body uh, radiation is you're, you're measuring energy flow and that's measuring not p or x, but you know p squared plus x squared. It's nonlinear. Now, the way I like, there's a modern way to view that experiment and to see quantum mechanics, which is something that I was involved in when I was at NIST about 20 years ago. It's, it's really cool. And you can see photons just really directly. And what you do is you take a laser, OK? And you take a laser, and you just pulse it briefly. Uh, in this case, it's uh, infrared, but it doesn't matter. And you pulse it for maybe a few nanoseconds or so. And you're going to have an, a classically an energy pulse. Okay? And then what you're going to do is shine that onto a very sensitive thermometer that absorbs the light and then heats up a little bit from the heat capacity when it absorbs that light. And you measure the temperature versus time. You measure the T pulses. Okay? And from that, you know the energy of it. And you make it small, and you make it at 100 millikelvin, so it's very sensitive, and superlink transitions, blah, 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 get that to work. And what you do is you see on the trace, when you do that, you see that it's some base temperature. This is the signal temperature versus time. And then the temperature goes up due to the heat capacity, and then due to the thermal conductivity to ground, it goes down again. And what's amazing, though, Okay, and you just you know, see the pulse as you would expect classically. But what you see when you do this is you see bands where there's pulses of this height and pulses of this height and this height. And if you histogram the pulse heights here, you see, you see this here, right? And this corresponds to the absorption of one photon, two photons, three, four, and five, etc. So you see that when you do this coherent state, Okay, which is a mixture of a large number of the, of the quantum states, and you start measuring the energy and the, the occupation, then it's quantized, uh, you know, give. and this is, this is just, you know, what you expect essentially from the Planck spectrum, except now, 100 years later, you're directly seeing the photon energies and somebody have to, to infer it statistically, statistical mechanically. So my statement is that all the undergraduate physics textbooks, they should ditch the, um, the, the very complicated der derivation of the, the, uh, um, the Maxwell, the Boltzmann, the, the distribution, and they should show this data because you definitely see the energy. And then, of course, you, you do the other thing historically and do all the complicated physics to show how that's consistent with that. But you directly see them, okay? And in fact, this nonlinearity is how you start generating these non-classical states and doing a lot of really interesting things uh, with this. And, and the, the uh, uh, other groups and, and groups in superconductivity have played a lot of games with that, using the nonlinearity uh, to make something interesting. In fact, I'll show you how we use the nonlinearity to make qubits. Okay, so this is key. Okay, and, and you know this. This is, you know, this is the physics. The photon is, is observed because you have a nonlinear detector, in this case, that looks at energy and, and sees that interest. Okay. So that's fun. So here's the picture again. We have this, this plane here. We have a bunch of quantum harmonic oscillator states. And if we drive it classically, we just, uh, you know, drive it in, uh, as we drive it, it just gets bigger and bigger. Let's say that the microwaves were driving at a little bit different frequency. Then it'll start driving this way, but then 
that frequency will start, slight change in frequency over time will be the phase going this way will be different. So then this will curve around and actually come back to itself uh, if it's slightly off in frequency. If it's not off in frequency, it'll just get bigger and bigger, of course. Okay, and you can, you can change the phase of the drive and the amplitude with uh, force times time and do that. Okay. Now, we want to do something with qubits. And what we, the way to get interesting qubit behavior out of these kind of electromagnetic systems, the Josephson systems, is to take this and make this nonlinear. Okay, make a nonlinear oscillator. And what, I'm going to show how we do that later. Oh, God, it didn't come out. Okay. And what we do is we, uh, we make this nonlinear so that as the energy of the system gets bigger, the oscillation frequency goes down. And that means the zero to one transition, this is on resonance, you know, like before, but now this frequency is a little bit different. So for driving it with microwaves, this will be on resonant and we'll see some interaction there, but this will be off resonant. And if you set it up in long enough pulse and other things I'll talk about later, you're not going to drive this transitions and you'll stay on two states only with a nonlinearity. And then you get interesting quantum mechanics. Now, what is the quantum mechanics when you drive a two-state two system? What is really interesting to note, that it's more or less the same physics that we saw before for the linear oscillator, but now the space of that it lives on and moves on is a block sphere, is a sphere. Okay, so I, I'm, I'm sure everyone's heard of the block sphere. Okay, so now it's not on a plane anymore, it's on a sphere. So now if you drive alpha, okay, here it just gets bigger and bigger amplitude. Now what will happen is you'll, you'll raise the amplitude and then it'll go all the way down to the bottom of the block sphere where you're in the one state. So it'll make that transition. But instead of doing other transitions and going up, it'll just curl back onto itself and make a downward transition uh, down. And of course, this interesting sphere gives you all the, the, uh, you know, the standard uh, qubit behavior that, that we're interested in. But the same thing that happens then. You change the microwave drive, you'll change the angle that you're, you're, you're driving here. The longer you drive this, the more angle it goes through here. But of course, at a certain point, it'll come back on itself. Yes? Where does the nonlinearity come from? Excuse me? Yes, yeah, so the nonlinearity is going to come from the Josephs injunction, which I'll show you how that works yeah, in it. But that, yeah, this is from the Josephs injunction. And we, yeah, we can start. Okay, so that's the idea. Okay, now I'm going to review a little bit about the block sphere, just, you know, because it's the basic physics is what's going on. And then uh, I'll kind of stop talking about the block sphere because I want to talk about gates, because that's kind of, uh, that's the, the, the language of, of the computer science. Okay, so we're for two, where you have a two, two level state. And uh, you can think of it as a spin in a magnetic field where the B field is the control of the system. And it's a, it's a sigma dot B Hamiltonian where we have sigma X, sigma Y, sigma Z. And then we have the B field BX, uh, BX, BY, BZ, sigma dot, dot Z. Okay. Uh, and, you know, we know how to solve that. The first example, you have a strong B, BZ field. You have an energy difference between the zero and one state. You can write the, the wave function in general where theta is the tilt angle and phi is the azimuthal angle here and uh, you can describe uh, the state uh, and of course the probability is the projection of this vector onto this direction. Okay, so we, that's all the standard, uh, the standard things here. Note that when you have a B field, you have a, a, a oscillation of the one state with respect to zero, so this is oscillating around in this direction. And then you can always go to a rotating frame like we did to the harmonic oscillator in which that doesn't rotate anymore. And then you've kind of removed away the Z field uh, uh, if, if you want to do that. 
in this kind of the same way as we did classically. Uh, this is, uh, I mostly give this so that you're ever in an exam and you have to remember formulas. You can do it. Plus, if you want to know what's going on with your state, this is very physical. And the qubit physics is that you basically see that the eigenstates directly follow your, a control vector. So the control vector, I'm going to write as a bx, by, and bz that kind of lives in a parallel space to the block sphere space. And then what happens is, is the energy of the system is just the length of this, uh, the eigenstate energy is just the length of the total B field. The eigenstates, and this is the important thing to remember on your exams, okay, is that the eigenstate here, uh, states are pointing in the same direction as that B field. So that's really, you know, you can diagonalize the matrix or you can just remember that fact and then it, it's there. And what's cool is that if this vector is not in the eigenstate direction, let's say it's pointed to this direction a little bit, if it's pointed here, then this will just rotate around the eigenstate vector. Just like when we had a Z field, it rotate around the Z field. If it's here, it's rotating around. So you know all the dynamics, because the rotation speed is given by the, the eigenstates, energies. Okay. So you know all, you just qualitatively, graphically, you, can, you, can, you know what's going on. You can solve it mathematically, uh, but this, I have a poor memory. This is much easier to remember. Okay. And you can picture what's going on. Okay? So that should be a review. That's kind of cool that the physics is so simple. We want to talk about gates, because that's what computer scientists think about. We do something to the qubit, what happens to it? And with the block sphere, you can uh, compute that. Let's say that you have a change in the B field. It goes up and down a little bit. So the B field goes up and down. And you can easily, it's in the Z direction, so you can easily integrate that. And that'll just give you a phase shift which I write as a Z uh, delta phi operator, which uh, if I get this right, Z delta phi is basically going to do nothing on the diagonals, and it's going to be E to the I phi. I forget whether that's a plus or minus, but um, that's a, a delta phi. OK. So very simple operator. And what's nice is the algebra of these Z gates are very simple. If I put in one pulse and give it a phase change alpha, I put in another pulse beta, that's equivalent to just adding up one pulse of alpha plus beta. So things are very simple. OK. Uh, you can, of course, do the same thing in the x and y directions. OK, you can rotate around this way and this way. In which case, you do that by putting on microwaves. And I won't go through the whole rotating wave approximation, whatever, but you can, you can do that. And uh, you can uh, just put on the microwaves resonant with the transition frequency. And for one phase, you'll rotate around this axis. And for another phase, uh, uh, that's pi over 2, different than that, you'll rotate around this direction. And just like the z directions, if you're rotating in one direction, you just add the phases. Of course, what gets very interesting and complex is you start rotating around different directions. And because it's a sphere, then everything gets you know, kind of uh, complicated and whatever. But the point is, is that knowing the directions and knowing the, the, the rotation, that's equivalent to a third axis and a third rotation angle that you can just compute. That's some standard formula. It's not hard to compute that. So there's just a transformation. So you can make simplifications of gates. Okay. So let me give you an example why this is important, why computer scientists care about that. You know computer scientists or, or digital designers, they have not gates. And you have theorems that say if you have two not gates, that's equivalent to doing nothing. So you can take some complicated circuit and, and simplify that. In the same thing here, you have two rotations, and you can simplify that to one rotation, or maybe even nothing if it happens to be the right thing. 
So this is very useful to know, and, and you can do it. So it's very, very analogous to what people already know for digital circuit design. But uh, OK, it's just a richer topology and whatever. But this is the same concept, which is good. See, this is why you want to talk about gates instead of Hamiltonians, because they understand these concepts with gates. You know, and OK, it's just more complicated. There's another rule set. That's OK. Whereas, you know, block sphere, that's, that's kind of harder to understand. OK? We OK with that? OK. And we can skip that. OK. So the experiments that we do all the time to see if our qubits are working right is the following. Uh, this is some kind of control signal versus time. And then we just let the system decay to the ground state by waiting, let's say, a millisecond or so. And then we'll put on a pulse of microwaves of various, uh, so let's say, certain time. Uh, uh, and uh, let's say where we, the time times the amplitude is some known uh, uh, dimension here. So this would be the rotation phase. Certain time, which gives you a gate, uh, you know, for, for versus theta. And then we do a measurement. And again, I'll discuss later how we do that. Uh, and then we adjust the frequency of this, okay, versus the, let's say the pulse duration here. And we measure what's the probability to be in the zero state. So if we do nothing, the probability of the zero state is one. And then as we put on these microwaves, we get the oscillations uh, between one to zero to one to zero to one to zero, which are normal Rabi oscillations. And then you get the biggest oscillations when it's on resonance, which is right here. And in terms of the block sphere, that means you're just going from the, the, the pole to the other pole and then back again, making a full oscillation, okay? And then if you're off resonance, then it turns out you're not rotating on the equator, but you're rotating away from the equator. So now you're going to be rotating not to the other pole, and then the oscillation amplitude is not going to be as big. So you can understand what's going on here through the simple block sphere. Uh, this particular gate where you take a, where, so first of all, you can see the resonant condition, and that's how we measure it all the time. You see the maximum uh, contrast here. Uh, and then we can see these oscillations die away. We go here. When we go from one to zero, that's going to take a zero state to a one state or one state to a zero state. And that's the quantum equivalent to a classical not gate. Okay? So that's our not operation. Okay? And this particular uh, uh, amplitude right here, which is half the time, uh, goes to about 50% zero, uh, 0 to 1, and that takes instead of a 0 to a 1, that goes to a 0 to 0 plus 1. And uh, I'm, we're going to call that the square root of not gate. Because if we put this amount of time here and this amount of time, we get a not. So square root not, square root not is a not. Okay. And of course, Classically, there's no square root of not. So this is some weird thing that goes on with quantum mechanics we have to deal with. Um, so that's the basic thing, how we tune it up, how we know what's going on, get all the parameters. And uh, you know, here's, for example, this is Hadamard, if you've seen that. Basically, within this band right here, anywhere here, you can make any gate. And as long as you're able to change the microwave phase and change the rotation angle, which you can do, you can get any gate you want. Okay, and so that's how we do all our logic. Okay, and I'll show you know show physically what that looks like. Okay. Okay. So now let's talk about how uh, how these uh, these things work and how we generate that. I'll talk. We we'll start with a qualitative description and then you know get to the mathematics later. So. Uh, uh, we have these quantum circuits. We quantize the current and voltages. Um, uh, the key parameter is oscillation frequency, typically around 5 gigahertz. And uh, 5 gigahertz, h-bar times 5 gigahertz is much greater than uh, k-boltzmann times 20 millikelvin or 10 millikelvin is what we can get into a dilution refrigerator. Okay, so 
5 gigahertz is about uh, 250 millikelvin in temperature. So we're uh, 10 times below that. You get an exponential suppression of thermal effects. Everything's good. Now you might ask, oh, this is really pesky to operate at 10 or 20 millikelvin in a dilution refrigerator. True. Okay. But what would happen if you went to a higher temperature? Let's say a helium-3 refrigerator, 0.3 Kelvin. That'd be 10 times higher. And then I want to be operating at 50 gigahertz. Now, for, there's probably not a lot of microwave engineers here. 50 gigahertz is a lot harder than 5 gigahertz. I mean, 5 gigahertz or so, that's cell phone technology. There are a ton of cheap components out there. It's not too hard to do the microwave engineering. When you get up to 50 gigahertz, gets hard. So as experimentalists, we have to decide, you know, how to be lazy, okay? It's way easier to operate at 10, 20 millikelvin than it is to operate at high frequencies. But in principle, you could trade those off, but practically do that. And in fact, the, one of the reasons it's so successful is that we kind of have a sweet spot in technology and that you can buy dilution refrigerators, they're expensive, and you have to know how to use them, but you just buy them and it works. And you just design things around five gigahertz, which isn't too hard, and it works. And then you can get your system to work. And somehow that combination works really well. We can make uh, linear, uh, linear LC oscillators, inductor capacitors. Typically what we'll make is a, uh, a cut in a line, a, a line Okay, just, just a, a, a wire <laughs> and maybe put a ground plane of superconductors around that. For those experimentalists, this looks like a coax, which is a tube and a wire, but in two dimensions. And then this length either can, is typically lambda over two to form a, uh, a in terms of uh, current forms a, a node, an oscillating mode like that. Sometimes we make it lambda over four where this is uh, uh, grounded and this is not. But you basically make a, a standing wave, like a string, string resonator. Okay, you've studied that. You know what that looks like. And if we do that, this is a few centimeters long, uh, given kind of by here. These are old qubits, a few centimeters long. You make an LC resonator at that resonance. And like you said before, you have those, those things here. What we do here is we replace this linear inductance with a nonlinear Josephson inductance, which is basically made by evaporating, let's say, aluminum, and then bleeding in some oxygen. So it forms aluminum oxide and then aluminum on top. And uh, this is thin enough with this oxide, thin oxide here, a few nanometers, that Cooper pairs can tunnel through here and give you a supercurrent. And that lacks like an uh, inductor, the Joseph's an inductance. And that forms an LC oscillator, okay? But the key is that from a Joseph's junction, this is a nonlinear LC inductor. So that it actually forms like a cosine potential given here. Here's the harmonic oscillator and then you're gonna get the nonlinearity here. And I'm gonna go into this in detail, how that works. But that's all that's happening. Now the magic here, there's magic here. Okay? I wouldn't be talking to you today if nature wasn't kind to us in our field. It's been very kind. And the kindness is that you have this nonlinearity that happens at really, really tiny energies. Okay? You know, if I take a capacitor, okay, and I drive it with you know, 10 or 100 volts, okay? That capacitance will start going nonlinear just before you start seeing smoke coming out of it, okay? That's the general principle. And any component can go nonlinear when you drive it high, but it's amazing here that it goes nonlinear when you put H bar omega, where omega is five gigahertz, of energy into it, tiny, tiny amount of energy in it. And moreover, what happens is the loss mechanisms of this Josephson junction are essentially gone because of some funny things of superconductivity. We're not sensitive to various defects in here. 
So you basically form this nonlinear oscillator that has no loss at all, just like a regular superconductor has no loss. The, I think the way to see that is you know that if you have impurities in the defects here, you know that that doesn't affect the superconductivity as long as they're not too big. Uh, and you can think of a tunnel junction as an impurity. Okay, and for the same reason that impurities don't impede superconductivity, uh, it, it doesn't impede TC, it, it maybe changed the critical current, but doesn't affect the essential physics, the same thing happens there. It's, it's magical. If it, if it wouldn't, wouldn't work, we wouldn't be here. Okay. So this is still a little bit of introduction. Here's the chip uh, where these Josephson junctions and transmons are in here. Like I said, we put it in a dilution refrigerator at about 20 millikelvin with wires going up to control that. And then here's a picture of it in the lab uh, with all this computer controlled and, and uh, doing all that. So those are the pictures. Okay. But I, I, let me explain how it works next. That's the important thing. Okay. Now, oh, okay. Before I explain in detail how that works and how the nonlinearity works, I need to pause for a second and talk about uh, linear circuit theory. Okay? So this is what I teach, or when I used to teach, uh, circuits uh, and, and electronics to undergraduates at UCSB. And we would go through this for a whole semester. And it's pretty simple stuff, but to really understand it, it usually takes people about five weeks to like get it so that they just really see it. So this is not too hard, but it's a little bit subtle, but it's, it's such an important thing. Think of this as a kind of a, a, a you know, in, in physics, you solve problems all the time by doing a coordinate transformation. You change your basis, and then in some basis, things are like a lot simpler to understand. That's what's going on here. And in fact, fundamentally what's going on is you're, you're instead of thinking circuits as where is the current flowing, where is the voltages? From that in Kirchhoff's law, you know everything, okay? You do a basis transformation where you, you keep track of the voltage, but you keep track of the impedance of circuit elements in there in some proper way, okay? And okay, it's the same thing. You do voltage because that's what you can measure with an oscilloscope. And then impedance is just this cra crazy thing, but it, it helps you, once you understand that concept, it's great. So, you know, impedance is nothing other than R for a resistor. For an inductor, it's I omega L. So Z is equal, this is Z for inductor, or 1 over I omega C for a capacitor. So it's just the generalization of a concept of resistance, an Ohm's law, okay? So an inductor kind of looks like a resistor, only that the impedance goes up uh, as, as the frequency goes up, and this I factor means that the voltage and current are 90 degrees out of phase as opposed to resistor, which means there's no energy loss here, which you know about, okay, and inversely for a capacitor, okay. Now what happens is, is uh, so that's the basic things, and you, you have things, this is great, you have things like, uh, the, you know, you add two, you have two resistors in series, you add their resistance, to get a total effect of resistance, and you can add their impedances. The same, the same laws here. If you have two resistors in parallel, then you add one over the Zs, or their admittance, and then uh, uh, that tells you what effectively. So you can simplify circuits. Just like I can simplify this to this, I can simplify a circuit of two resistors is equal to one resistor, which is great. Okay, you know, that's much better. So I can, I can reduce the complexity. Okay. These are things that you probably vaguely remember from your circuit theory. And here's a just a generalization that inductors and capacitors work this way. 
This is something a little bit more complicated, kind of a Thevenin and Norton uh, uh, things. And it says, when you have a complex linear circuit, okay, you can always break that up into a source, a dissipated part, and a dispersive part. Okay, we can kind of see the dissipative and dispersive part here. Okay, and this is basically the real part and the imaginary part, and this is an offset if you were to write down some response. Not, not too complicated. This, now you're, you're, you're familiar with batteries, okay, where you take something and no matter how much current you pull out of it, it has the same voltage. Okay, you're, you're and this is a current source, which is a dual or a conjugate of the battery in that no matter what voltage cross it comes across that thing, you put a certain current that comes, comes out of it. So this is a current source or a charge source, and this is a battery or a voltage source. So any circuit can be written in this way. And, uh, and uh, the Thevenin equivalent says that if you have this kind of source, a voltage source and an impedance, that's equivalent to an impedance and a current source that's equal to voltage over Z. Okay. So we're going to use these laws all the time. This thing can be derived easily. If this is open sourced and you just have a battery across it, of course you measure V. And if this is open source, then this current goes through Z and V over Z times Z is V, and you get V. If this is shorted here, the current is V over Z. If this is shorted, all the current's going to flow through the short and not through here, and that's V over Z. In fact, if you get, match those two cases and it's linear, it's always true. Yes? So uh, does this kind of circuit work for all the frequencies or just one single frequency? So, uh, th uh, so what happens is if this is frequency dependent, then this transfer, this is frequency dependent too. So you could have a current source that's frequency dependent. But it's true, it's, it's just for a linear circuit, even if there's a frequency dependent, it's true. Now, what we tend to do is we have a complex linear circuit, we're dealing with resonators. When we wanna know what's happening to that resonator at the resonant frequency. So what we typically do is put in the capacitor here that's appropriate for that frequency, usually it's fixed. But this dissipation here can be frequency dependent, but we'll just think about this as a resistor at that frequency, and that's a good enough approximation. So uh, we, we can use these kind of simplifying concepts like resistor, resistors, capacitor, inductors, and because we have resonant circuits, we can simplify things and, and ignore some of those things. Exactly. Usually it's what is the frequency, because that's what matters. It's what's happening at the oscillation frequency. So that's another simplification here is this can be frequency dependent and complicated, but you really only care about that one or maybe a few frequencies, and you need to know it there. There is another question. Yes. So quantum mechanics is linear. So say you also this linear circuit, right? Yeah. So you just can't change it's nonlinear. It's nonlinear, yes. Good question. Yes. Yeah, so this is what's really cool, is you have a linear part and you have a nonlinear part. The linear part of the circuit, you can transform this way, and it's equivalent. And then you just, after you do all that transformation to simplify it, you connect it to your nonlinear circuit and you analyze it. So the, this linear analysis works on any subset of circuit and you know you build some complicated circuit path, or whatever you 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 analyze it this way, and then you just put in the nonlinear junction and you solve it. Okay, so that's what's really cool. So you can figure out what's going on pretty far uh, uh, doing that. Okay, so let me give you an example. Okay, so here's our transmon device, and this is a ground plane everywhere with cuts in it, okay? And this little cross here forms a capacitor, okay? Okay, and then there's gonna be, the Johnson junction down here is a nonlinear inductor, but we're gonna worry about that later. I just wanna know what happens to this part of the circuit. 
Also in this part of the circuit, there's another wire coming to here with the voltage, which is a, comes on with a coaxial wire from room temperature that puts a voltage on it. It's going to look like a 50 ohm resistor because it's a coax, okay? But that's a 50 ohm resistor. And then there's a little gap here, and the electric fields jump over this ground plane in the third dimension and give you some coupling capacitance. So this coupling capacitance is about 50 attafarads, and this capacitance to ground is almost about 100 femtofarads. And if you compute what is 1 over omega c, which is the magnitude of the impedance, this is about 100 ohms, and this is about 100 kilo ohms at 6, at 6 gigahertz, of course. So just to give you an idea of what those quantities are. Okay? Now, what we model this is if we have a voltage here, and we're driving this with a capacitor, okay, that's how we're coupling it. So what happens is we put a voltage here, and then that drives current into, into this through that capacitance. And to model that properly, what we do is we say a voltage in series with a capacitor is equivalent to a charge source in parallel with, a, with that same coupling capacitor, using the feminine equivalent theorem that I just talked about. And this charge is equal to CC times V. You see the dimensions are right, okay? And now what I say is, look, this CC is 50 attafarads. It's a thousand times less than this. I don't know my parameters that well, so I can even ignore that and just say this is driving this. And then I can write down the Hamiltonian later on. I'll do that, given that you have a charge dry by a source. You can just write down what that Hamiltonian is. So it's pretty simple, OK? And you see that as the capacitance here gets less and less, then you have to put a bigger and bigger voltage here to be able to drive at the same amount, which makes sense. If there's less capacitance, you have to push it harder. OK. Now. The other thing is, whenever you connect up your qubit to the external world, something can go wrong with it, right? Your the external worlds can be measuring or doing stuff to it. And the way that that is understood is that this is coming in with a, a coax coming in. This is a traveling wave, which has a, a, an impedance that looks like uh, 50 ohms, which means essentially from this point looking in this way, it looks like a 50 ohm resistor. And it has, you know, noise and it has all the properties of the anticipation of that. So what we do is we say, okay, if we want to measure the loss, what we do is we just take that as a 50 ohm resistor and analyze this circuit. Okay, this resistor here is going to damp us. Note that this capacitance is small, so this is not going to see much of this resistor. It's kind of isolated and put away. Okay, how do you do the analysis? Well, this analysis is hard to do. What we want to do is turn this series circuit into a parallel circuit, okay? And then again, this is negligible this, and this is a parallel circuit of R parallel and C, okay? So when you have a circuit, of R parallel and C, okay? The decay time, which I'll call magically T1, so the decay time of the circuit is R parallel times C. And it's true even when you make a resonant circuit. Okay. So I can compute what would be the decay time from the driving circuit uh, on, on, on the qubit, okay? Just, you know, with this, simple, with this simple thing. And of course, what we do is we make this coupling small enough so that this time is way longer than our other decay times, and then we're okay. So how do you calculate that? Well, to turn a series circuit into a parallel circuit, I look at one over the series resistance, so the series resistance is 1 plus 1 over I omega C coupling, okay? And then I, uh, I want to put uh, uh, all the I's, 
separate the real and imaginary in the numerator because it's a, it's a parallel circuit. So I, I, I need to uh, make these as a sum of, of 1 over impedances. So I just do the complex conjugate in the bottom. Here it is on the top. The resistance here is 50 ohms. This is 10 kilo ohms. I can ignore that. So you get R over 1 over I omega C coupling. This, is the, this will be a resonant frequency. And then this is the capacitance. So this formula here, this here is just this capacitance as a, you know, as a parallel circuit. And this here is this, uh, this right here. Okay? And you see that if you want this to be a large resistor, here, so that T1 is large, okay? So the way to make, uh, to make uh, this, uh, this large is you make CC very small, kind of decoupling from your drive circuit, or you make R small. And it tells you how to compute that. Okay. So this tells you kind of having large CC gives you large coupling. Your voltage doesn't have to be as big. But it also says you want small coupling so that the effect of damping on your circuit is going to be very small. And you just work through the formulas and figure that out. OK? Uh, sorry, this is a little bit uh, uh, simplified. But it's, it's really how we calculate things. And it shows you the power of the linear circuits. You can write down the Hamiltonians. And you can write down, uh, you know, uh, the, the the, the T1 decay with the matrix element squared and density of states and blah, blah, blah. Okay, it's great. It works, you know, but this, this is nice. You can really figure out what's going on here. Okay? Okay. Um, I'm also going to give another example here, which is very similar to the, the, the previous example. Um, what we have here is we want to measure some microwave resonance circuits. We have a sample box. We have microwaves coming in that drives the circuit. And then we measure the response of it coming out here. Here's the circuit we saw last time. Instead of capacitor, there's an inductor here for an LC resonance circuit. Capacitance coming in. That rings it up. And then we have another capacitor here coming to the output that we then measure this voltage coming through here, OK? And then, as we said before, these resistances turn into parallel resistance uh, given here. Now there's a parallel resistance from this guy and parallel resistance from this guy. We just sum it up. You have an LCR resonant circuit, OK? So that the resonant frequency is 1 over root LC. And the Q is omega 0 RC, OK? And then the T1, the decay time, is RC, as I said last time. And that's, you just, you've done this before and as an undergraduate, OK? And then to analyze the circuit, what happens is when you have a voltage driving here, you drive this with a charge. This resonates this up. And then you have a. Uh, 100 kilo ohm impedance here and 50 ohm impedance here. And this voltage gets divided down by those two in impedances to a smaller voltage, which you measure coming out here. And you can analyze that straightforwardly. OK? Questions on that? Okay, so that, you know, that's how you think about these things. Uh, I'm, I'll just skip. I'm going to skip this. It's for, for the experts here, if you want to know another case uh, that's more important, uh, that's fine. OK. Let's go on to the quantum harmonic oscillator now. OK. Ah, I've written down a Hamiltonian. That's great. And all I've done is written down the classical Hamiltonian. And then I put these hats on it. So that makes me a quantum physicist. And then I take these and write the commutation relation. And I quantize it. We all know what that means. OK. And then when you solve it quantum mechanically, you get the eigenstates separated by h bar, the oscillation frequency. There's a zero point energy, of course. And then you want to write what the operators are until in terms of the 
uh, uh, creation and annihilation operators, which are given here. And I want to write it in a form that will help you remember, if you ever have an exam where you have to do this, it'll help you remember what these constants are. Okay, so these are a flux zero point and a charge zero point. So dimensionally, okay, that's fine. And the way to remember these things is that the energy of the zero point fluctuations, flux zero point squared over 2L, is equal to that in the capacitor, and they're one fourth h bar omega, because if you add up this plus add up this, you'll get the zero point energy of half h bar omega. Okay, so that's how you remember, at least I do. I don't have a good memory. Okay? So you've, you've, solved, you've solved the problem uh, for, a, for an LC oscillator. Uh, one of the interesting things to do is to uh, actually talk about the, the, the scale of these fluctuations, which not, doesn't involve the oscillation frequency, it in, involves the impedance of the oscillator, which is a kind of a weird concept, but let's go into that, okay? So you want to know, is the zero point of the oscillations much bigger than the, how does it compare to the flux quantum? And how does the charge zero point fluctuations compare to 2E? Because this is a superconducting system. Uh, th these are kind of natural scales that you want to know that. And when you go through and you calculate all this, then you find that these numbers uh, go as this very interesting ratio, which is the impedance of the oscillator uh, divided by the quantum uh, resistance with some factors here. So I've given the quantum resistance here. What I haven't given here, which is a mistake, is that the impedance of the oscillator, uh, Z0, equals square root of LC, which you can equivalently write as a omega 0 L, which is what is the inductance impedance on resonance, or equivalently 1 over omega 0 C what is the capacitive impedance on resonance, okay? That's what Z0 is. So given these L's and C's and omega zeros. So, you know, again, I, I said this is very strange. We're dealing with the, the physics of an impedance. What the heck does that mean? We don't have a lot of intuition on that, okay? It, it's, uh, so it's important to talk about. We understand oscillation frequency very well. So we start with L and C, right? These are design parameters. And now we're talking about omega zero and Z zero as the design parameters, okay? This is physically what you do, but the physics of the system is dependent on the, we all understand the frequency, but the impedance is so trickier. And I've been to lots of talks in the past where people make oscillators and they pose, pose new things. And no one really talks to me about the impedance. And this impedance tells you not whether you're going to get some oscillator right frequency, but tells you whether the damn thing will work and whether it'll couple together properly or whatever. There's a lot of information in here. So it's important. And what it, it does here, for example, with the impedance, it says that the impedance is low, okay, then the, the, the flux kind of fluctuations in it is much smaller than the flux quantum, and then the charge fluctuations are much bigger than 2E. In this case, you have lots of Cooper pairs suddenly through the circuits, okay, but the, the classical, the, the phase of the superconductor is pretty good, uh, classical phase is a pretty good uh, quantum number. And if you go the other way around, then this is very uncertain, and you, you, can, talk, you can talk about it as a charge qubit. Charge qubits are in the case where Z0 is much bigger than RK. So in the talk to earlier today, when they were having the tunable coupling and uh, going between charge and phase basis, they were, you know, you were changing Z0 by changing L. Okay, nature gives you, when you build regular oscillators, 
nature around 300 free space impedance, typically around 50 ohms because of other design constraints. So typically, this is small fluctuation and this is big uh, fluctuations. And that's typically what we're working. But it is possible to make devices in the other, op other directions. And it's inter interesting and they can work. I'll talk more about the concerns with that. Okay, so, so the impedance of what we build is actually important. Okay. Again, I understand uh, impedance is not normally understood intuitively by people. Uh, it's actually an important concept to make sure you understand. And again, we were just saying that before. We have this capacitor here. We have inductors here. This is a nonlinear LC resonator and uh, uh, we, can, we can do it. Well, one thing I will note is we typically put two junctions down here in a loop, and we can put current into here and phase into this very small loop, and that will change the effective critical current of this device so it's a variable L as well as being a nonlinear L. Uh, so we can change the resonant frequency uh, uh, also as we do that. But, ooh, We'll, uh, we'll probably, we'll talk more about that later. Okay. Joseph's injunction is a nonlinear inductor. Let's get into this. Um, uh, we have the Joseph's, I'm going to just start with the Joseph's in relations. You can see this in other books to understand this. You have a voltage, which is uh, H bar over 2E times uh, the phase difference, okay? And uh, uh, the current is uh, some material parameter having to do with how big the junction is and the tunneling electrons through that, through the sign of the phase difference. Uh, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to uh, uh, say that this phase difference is going to look like a dimensionless flux. So this relation here looks like V equals flux dot, which you know as long as we identify this as the dimensionless flux. So this is essentially Faraday's law uh, with this redefinition. So uh, if I want to take these two equations and let's say differentiate this equation here, I, I will get I equals I zero is a constant. Differentiating this is a cosine delta delta dot. Delta dot's proportional to voltage. And uh, I'll write that here. And 1 over Lj, uh, this gets converted into a Josephson inductance given by this formula right here as a nonlinear inductance. Okay? So when you have I dot is equal to constant times the voltage, that's the equation of motion for an inductor. That's the point. These two equations uh, represent that. And this inductance, you know, V equals Li dot, this inductance here is nonlinear in the sense that there's the phase across the junction, the flux, effective flux across the junction changes, uh, uh, this inductance is going to change. Okay. Uh, uh, the other way to see that is you have I is, give, is given by I is some function of flux. If I were proportional to flux, that's an inductor. But because of the sine function here, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's nonlinear. Okay. You can also talk about the Joseph energy, which is just current times voltage, which is power integrated over time. DT sine of delta, D delta DTs, the DTs cancel out. Sine of delta, D delta is cosine delta. And you get a junction energy, how much energy is stored in the, ju in the junction uh, that goes as, uh, as cosine delta. Okay, and then I'll explain what that means. Questions on this? This is the nonlinear. This directly comes from the, uh, from the Josephson relations. This uh, Josephson injunctions is basically a kinetic inductance of the, tunnel, of the tunneling of the electrons through there. And because of the interference effects of this, this tunneling it can have some nonlinear components to it. But you're, you're, you're storing the energy here in this uh, quantum kinetic component of the tunneling of the electrons. 
Okay. Okay. So here's the energy. Notice this is all, this is classical description here. Okay, so it's energy, not Hamiltonian yet. Q squared over 2C, given by this. I'm going to just change coordinate system to have dimensionless charge, N, and flux phase going back and forth here. So now we have uh, 4 E over C, N squared. This is the number of Cooper pairs, the Josephson phase across the junction. And then we have energies of a charging energy and a Josephson energy give here given here. This is, you know, charging of a single electron, and these, this is called the Josephson energy here. And then I'm going to plot the energy here in blue. This is the cosine, and then if you were just take the parabolic nature here and extend it here, you would get here. And you see that it's a nonlinear potential. Okay. I would like to note that this particular nonlinear potential with the current partial the sign is nothing but a harmonic oscillator. Okay, so uh, the, the force uh, or torque here being proportional to the angle here of the sine of the angle is exactly the same physics of, of this. So what we're looking at here is a, uh, is a, a pendulum. Okay. And you know from a pendulum, this is actually, I teach a class and the students measure that, as you go up in higher and higher amplitude, the frequency goes down. And in fact, if you put the frequency, if you put the pendulum directly like this, the frequency goes to zero, right? And in fact, you can see that if you were to uh, just compute, this numerically computing these oscillation frequencies versus energy, what we're going up here, it starts out at the, the omega zero, and then as the energy gets to the top of here, the frequency goes to zero, okay? And you can make this linear approximation down here that it's, it goes as 1 minus 1 eighth E over EJ. Okay. Everyone okay? This is classical harmonic oscillator. It's a nonlinear oscillator. Just work out the classical physics of that. And okay, here's the oscillation frequency. 1 over LJ0. What is the, what's the curvature at the bottom of this? And you can put that in terms of uh, these, these numbers. Notice there's an H bar there, but that's because these are energies and want there, that to be an energy. Okay, now let's do something fun. And let's do a poor man's quantization of this. Again, we're just trying to get the physics. I want you to understand the physics of this. What I'm going to do is say, look, in, you know, we're to start out with uh, the rough guess. This is kind of a linear oscillator, almost a linear oscillator. So we're just going to say, look, the quantum states are going to be uh, a zero point motion separated by h bar omega in terms of this direction. But then in the terms of the oscillation frequency, that oscillation frequency is going to go down and it's going to be given by these circles. So you're going to say, yeah, there's going to be quantized energy levels, same as the homeric oscillator, but as those energy levels get high, the oscillation frequency is going to drop. Okay, that's your natural guess. And then you can guess what, uh, what you know, from that and the linear thing, you can work out what that is. That gives you the right answer. Okay, so this very simple kind of uh, semi-classical argument uh, tells you uh, that there's nonlinearity, right? There's the nonlinearity is that these transition frequencies are dropping as you go to higher and higher energies. Okay? It's just, it's, you, can, you can understand it qualitatively uh, 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 with, with classical, semi-quantitatively, it actually gives you the right answer. Of course, you want to calculate it properly, so let's go do that. So, you know, so this is how you do it. So now we have the H hat, okay, and these are all operators with the commutation relation, okay. And then the cosine I can write out as a harmonic oscillator plus a perturbation that goes in delta the fourth. And from the harmonic oscillator part, I can write out what delta in N hat is. These are just the zero point energy terms I showed you before. These are all the parameters. And then if you want to know the what this is doing, you just write down the, the perturbation formula 
which is ej times delta to the 4 over 24, and there's a minus sign. And you just plug this in and work through all the, you know, fourth order commutation relations. And then you work out that uh, the, the nonlinearity. So if you want to know, uh, uh, yeah, and then the nonlinearity of, uh, of, of going from the energy from going from one energy level to the next, from the m to the n minus 1, goes as uh, m times ec. And this is the same formula that I showed uh, the last time. Okay, so that's the you know, standard calculation, kind of thing you would maybe have done as an undergraduate. And typically what we do is we choose this energy uh, thing in eta to be about 200 megahertz or so, which I'll explain in a few minutes why we do that. Okay? Questions on that? I am going to, I'm run out of time, I'm going to stop here and then we'll start talking about some more uh, subtle things here. So, so um, that's it for today. Thank you. <laughs> Any questions now? Or? I guess we're off to lunch then. Yeah, actually, um, with small coupling capacitor, that resistance gets transformed up to a high resistance. Oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, for for parallel, down. yeah, high, and the loss high, goes down. High and, resistance, and, and then because it's parallel, yeah. it, it, it's like it's almost open. Yeah, it's yeah. like it's not there. You also see um, in this sort of like effective uh, impedance in that parallel right. Uh, you still see some reactive part. Yeah, from the uh, capacitor. And uh, is there? Can I think about that as a lamp shift? Or, or what is the atomic Yeah, 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 that's right. Um, uh, there's a lot of confusion in the literature where okay. that transformed impedance changes the frequency and people have called it the lamp shift. Yeah, yeah. And I dislike that greatly okay. because the lamp shift takes a purely resistive load, yeah. you know, of an atom coupled to something. There's no capacitor there, you know, it, it, and, then, and then you get a, a shift from that. And it's a, it's a different, it's a very subtle different uh, um, uh, physical effect uh, that, uh, uh, so this is kind of, this is a trivial lamb shift yeah. just from impedance transformations, whereas the lamb shift is a much more subtle thing that's going on an so, interaction so between the levels. So part of some environmental impedance or emissions yeah, but you would not call. Yeah, I, I would not. Other people in the field uh, have called it the lamb yeah. shift. And when I've complained about this in talks and whatever, no one knows what I'm talking about. But I think for atomic physicists, they, they understand the subtlety there. Yeah. So, you know, if you, have a, if you have an atom in an optical cavity, yeah. that optical cavity is going to shift the frequency. I don't know if you would call that, you probably wouldn't call that the lamb shift. Yeah. I mean, you know, uh, so, so uh, uh, you would just say that there's some dispersive interaction. And that's what's going on here. Okay, thanks. Yeah, yeah. Uh, thank you for a very nice presentation. Okay. I, I would like to ask, will you have it online later? Yeah, I can put this online if people so, uh, would like that. It's, it's okay, very great. good. Uh, unfortunately, I may not be able to come to all of your presentations. Okay. Today, yeah. To yeah the, these my, are all the basics. Work, I'm not sure yet. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. It, it's really nice. I kind of, uh, I've never very heard such a good uh, elementary presentation on these things. Okay. And I yeah. Yeah. That, it thank and, you. Uh, good. That, that's, like to, yeah, yeah. Uh, Go, like think about it. Yeah, 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 yeah. Good. Yeah, the, I, I, uh, uh, yeah. This is very much uh, written in this kind of pedagogical way that is using standard things and trying to eliminate the, all the complexities of it. It's very, yeah, I really like this. Good. I'm, thank you. I'm glad you appreciate it. Okay, great. Thank you.
Do you guys have a question? Hi. Hi. Yeah, uh, so this uh, omega naught, which is the classical oscillator right. frequency, this seems to be related to also the, the charge dispersion of these versus EJ versus EC for a transform, right? In that case, also you get this yeah. exponential decay with the. Yeah, so I'm, I'm going to. Yeah, so I'm going to talk about that next slide. So I'll, I'll get to that. Yeah, the very next slide, I, I talk about uh, what happens with charging effects in this limit. But um, uh, yes, this is this is this is this is related. I'll, I'll put I'll piece this together. But we're 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 definitely working in the phase basis and not the charge basis. So we're talking about low impedance devices, whereas charge qubits are are high impedance devices, and they have a different. Band, you know, different bands and different structures. Yeah, but I'm just talking about the charge dispersion and the transform. Yes, I'm going to talk about that next. I have a simple derivation for that. I also, when you said x1, by that you just meant it's tunable junction. That's yeah, and, and with the particular geometry, yeah, it's a transmog. These are all, I'm talking about transmogs. So when you put two of them together, together you call it the. Um, it's more that we also put that in a ground plane. The way we put it in the ground plane is, is, is part of the, the x mon. At the time, uh, no one was doing that because everyone thought it could never work. So we you know, talked about how this new design, the tunable junctions, tunable, because people had tunable qubits before us, tunable junctions put in the ground plane. And then I would also say that we're really emphasizing that we're changing the frequency of the qubit as a ways to cause them to couple and not couple to the neighbors. I'll get to that. This is something you were Yeah, yeah, yeah. Also, uh, when you, in the beginning, when you said you want to go to these large atoms to have more control over... Right, right. Or more room from control. So, but uh, this control is dependent on, like, the kind of signal you apply, right? Like, so, yeah. So can you not, like, have a more... You know, I think there's a lot of experimental details there. What I would say is our signals are microwave signals, which you can shape and control exquisitely, and they're really cheap compared to laser pulses, for example. So you can have a lot, you have more accuracy and control and, and, and put in cheaper signals. And you know, the, the wavelengths of these signals are, are many centimeters, but you can put them on tiny little wires because, uh, you know, it's a, a TEM mode, you know, you can use a coat, like your microns across. Yes, so microns, but then you still need some bigger atoms, that's what you were trying to say. Yeah, yeah, I mean, uh, yeah, that's right. But it's nice to have, no, it's nice to have tiny control lines and big atoms. Because that means you can put in a lot of control in between all your atoms, for example. I mean, system optimization is very complicated, but you have a lot of latitude when you do that. So. Thanks. Thanks. Person. Sure. So if you have like a resonator, like I'll see your resonator, uh -huh. which I guess it's what, what you model when you have like those long wires or yeah. connecting wires. And at the end you put a like a Josephson junction or a right. squid, for example, right. like a circle. And um, so what, what's the range of parameters for which you can still uh, like uh, discard a nonlinearity and think that's like... Yeah, so, so this is only good in the low impedance limit. Um, that, uh, that you can do this nicely. And what I'm going to do in the next slide is talk about as your impedance goes from the very low to mo kind of moderate regime, then you start seeing some charge effects, the charging effects, and then I'll describe how that works this and, and kind of wh how that limits your, your parameters. So that, that's the very next slide. Okay. <laughs> but actually, I like the questions because that leads into my discussion. Yeah. Yes, thank you. So when you say the that it depends on the impedance, you mean this is a zero point uh, impedance? Right. Is it zero? Right. So why, may I ask, why do you like split these two constants if it only depends on the ratio? So why, why do you split? Uh, yeah, uh, yeah, so, so th I, I, I get this is a fundamental constant. And I talk about these fluctuations. Into, because this is, nature just gives you this ratio as you know the size of the fluctuations you know you you have two parameters 
One is the f resonant frequency, and the other is kind of, well, how much fluctuations do you have in the two coordinates? I mean, it's kind of a natural, natural way to think about it. But so this impedance, how should I think about this impedance? Uh, yeah, yeah, okay. Yeah, so this, this, is, this is the problem is, um, when you first understand impedance, it's very strange. And then after you use it a while, it becomes more and more uh, 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 thing. So normally you think of an impedance as you have a box, okay, and you put a voltage across it, and the impedance is the voltage to, and then f a current flows through it, and the impedance is the V over I ratio. So if you have a resistor, which is just a chunk of metal, then, uh, then uh, that resistance will, will tell you the proportionality between V and I. And it's an impedance. Uh, it's the same thing. You were to put, put a voltage across that junk, that in what looks like an inductor, and uh, you, uh, you will get a certain amount of current. And it's just the V over I ratio. So, so uh, yeah, it's, it's um, okay. Um, remember, the VO, this impedance is the response function. I'm trying to think in, in a theoretical way. It's the response function of that object. It's a linear object. So you know voltage is proportional to current. So all you have left to describe it is, is how it's going to respond in voltage and current in the ratio. And it kind of tells you what's going on. You can think about it, you know, Maxwell's equations, like the, the relation between an electric field, an oscillating electric field, and an oscillating but, field. Uh, I, I'm just going gonna, gonna to give an example here. I have a mass and I put a force on it. How much does it accelerate? Or if I put a force like this, how much does it move? If, if there was a bigger mass with a constant force, it would move less. So the mass here is kind of like an impedance. Okay. No, it was at the, this zero point, the, the what thing was kind of looking at the zero point impedance. So even if you have like in the current state of your system, you have this kind of, this kind of resistance. Well, yes, yeah, it's, it's a parameter, yeah, yeah, and that yeah, parameter yeah. then tells you the size of the zero-point fluctuation. Zero point, this is well, okay. and, and, you know, if you have different impedances, it says you're going to have more flux and less charge, or, you know, because that, that's a possibility, and that, that kind of number tells you what it is. It, it's good you think about it, because impe once you understand impedance, you, you get like a second dimension as, as to how you understand physics, and it's really useful. And experimentalists use this all the time, but it takes a, it basically takes about six months in, in a, a circuit class for students to like really get it. It's, it's complicated, it's, it's just subtle. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you're you. welcome. Yeah, so it's kind of interesting to watch students understand this. I, I, I say, same way, I, I kind of know how to use it, but it's, it's, a, it's, it's a very high level concept yeah. that's actually kind of useful. Well, it, it, well, you know, I, I'm, I'm defining the zero points in terms of the flux quantum and 2E. Uh -huh. So, you know, when you have H over 2E and E, it's easy to get E squared over H. Uh -huh. Okay, so, you know, it's because of the definition of, 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 of my, how I'm normalizing the zero point fluctuation. Okay, so, that means, where's phi naught coming from? Yeah. Uh, yeah. And, and wh how, why is, where is E coming from? <laughs> well, E, <coughs> someone, right. someone measured it and told me, look, the charge is yeah, yeah. quantized, so that's the Q. Yeah, and then, and then the H in the, in the flux quantum is coming from the quantum behavior of the, the fluid. Uh, you know, you have two E carriers, and then there's a, the quantum behavior of it, and you get the, you, you know, the yeah, it's like, uh, you know, the Josephson relationship is basically um, h bar phase dot equals uh, two e v. Okay. So. There you go. Yeah. So, and that's where you get the h over two e. You know. 
So yeah, and, and that and this act this H bar is coming from a, a gauge transformation. Uh, in the, um, uh, you you have a gauge of transformation that's two EV times T, and so it, it comes from the way that the uh, condensation works in the Josephson relation from the fundamental gauge transformation you do for the voltage. But somehow RK ends up defining, you know, what's the important fluctuations in the problem. Uh, yeah. I can't imagine it. I don't know where it's coming from. Well, well you know, it's kind of like, you know, g with the constants, you know, H over 2E of the superconductivity, that's a characteristic impedance of quantum. Okay, and so the quantum resistance. And uh, what happens naturally is you build circuits that are typically 50 ohms or 10 ohms, elopian circuits. And this is why almost all the experiments we do, you know, the phase is a good quantum variable and we can think about it. And that's kind of conventional superconductivity because free space is less than, than RK. And that's why, that's why you, you think in the phase, that's why most early experiments were done in that. And then people push hard to get into the opposite thing by making small junctions and you saw the charging physics. And then as I'll discuss next lecture, why we try to stay into the phase basis, there are reasons for that. Okay, thank you.